One of the characteristics is these long spines that come off the end. I think that's where it gets its name. As it matures, they'll get kind of wavy and kind of serpent-like, which is I think how it gets the name Medusa grass. But this is a this is an exotic grass that's native to the Mediterranean basin. Um, it's native in uh, parts of France and Spain and Portugal, and it's been introduced here. And many of these grasses are exotic. This one is of particular concern for a few a few key reasons. It's a it's a really aggressive competitor with um, with other native vegetation and other forage grasses. And then secondarily, it has a huge silica content, this tremendous si silica content, which makes its dead material very persistent. So this is another kind of char characteristic thing of grasslands invaded by medusa grasses. You tend to see this accumulation of this old gray thatch. And um, you know, so what this does, it changes the structure of the habitat for things like ground nesting birds. Um, but then also it, it great, greatly reduces the, um, the forage yield for uh, that could be for domestic livestock like cattle, but it could also be for deer or for uh, native animals that live out here. This stuff is really hard for them to digest. This bright green stuff here, just entering its rapid growth stage. And uh, that is one of the ways it's so successful because it reaches maturity in this kind of low competition environment after the other things have started to die back. But it's also a weakness in terms of management because it, or well, it creates an opportunity for us to isolate it with management. And what, what we're testing out here is the ability of a really carefully timed mowing during the mid, the mid flower stage to try to eliminate seed production. And so the way this works is it, this is an annual grass. It completes its life cycle in one year. And it depends on dumping tons of seeds in that one year to uh, generate the next population. So the idea with mowing is that, well, if you mow too early, any grass will regrow. And if you mow too late, it doesn't matter because the seeds are already in the ground. But we're trying to hit this in the middle of its growth stage before the seeds are developed, but after it's too late for it to grow back uh, to try to reduce the seed inputs for the next year. This is an example of a mowed plot. And uh, this has been mowed repeatedly twice uh, in uh, two different years during the mid-flower stage of Medusa headgrass. And uh, what we see when we look in here that there's, there's almost no Medusa head grass left in here, but all this other stuff has resisted because it's either there are other annual grasses whose seeds were already in the ground when we were mowing the Medusa head grass, or there are some, like this native squirrel tail grass, this is a native California grass, and it's actually a perennial, so it lives year after year. It can have its top mowed off just like your lawn and regrow. Um, and then the other thing that you can see just by looking at this place now is that the squirrel tail produces its seeds at a little bit different time than the medusa head grass. These guys are, are going to be coming on a little bit later than the medusa head grass. We come over here, outside of the mode clod. So this snake here, and Chance is standing by another one over there, mark the edges of where we mowed. As soon as we come out of there, you can see there's almost a line here, and on the other side, there's quite an abundance of the Medusa head grass. Um, and then you can see also a lot of this thatch like we were talking about still persistent here. One of the things that I want to measure out here is uh, um, the annual productivity in these plots. Okay, And so we can, we can get a good estimate of that by taking a, a known area. So this is a tenth meter here. And we just set it down in the plots. And then, and then clip all of the above ground vegetation. And this can then be divided into different species or different groups, such as Medusa head or non-Medusa head plants. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna clip that and then we dry it to get the dry weight. And, uh, and that'll give us a measure of overall above ground productivity and which groups are contributing the most to that productivity. Um, and then a, a, a third thing that we can do with that is we can actually take some of the tissue and analyze it for nutrient content. So once we determine the overall above ground productivity, we can then uh, break some of this down and analyze it for nutrient content to get an idea of uh, after we've mowed these different plots, mowed and unmowed and repeatedly mowed, how does this change the forage quality for, you know, and, and then of course the implication for that is if I'm a, if I'm a rancher, you know, if I'm trying to raise cattle on this land, 
what is the implication of this for my uh, nutrition of my animals? Or, you know, if we have wildlife out here that use these resources, the, the deer, the rabbits, a lot of the birds out here, um, all rely on these grasslands as food resources. I'm looking to see if there are changes in uh, available soil nitrogen. Nitrogen is a, is a major limiting nutrient in these grassland ecosystems. So I want to see if there are differences in available soil nitrogen in the different treatment groups. And uh, we, we measure that in two ways. Uh, one of the ways is that I take these soil cores throughout the year, four times at the year. I take these soil cores, two centimeter diameter core, and then I'll take them back to the lab where I grind them down and I can actually extract nitrogen from that and it gives me a very precise measure at a given point in time about how much available nitrogen is. By doing that four times over the year we can see if there's a particular time of the year when there might be a difference between these plots. Um, and then the second way that we do that, we have a way of measuring overall um, like a differences in soil nitrogen over the growing season or over a longer period of time by burying these, these uh, resins. They're called cation exchange resins. It's just a small kind of a filter bag full of a resin and we buried these at the beginning of the growing season back in November and uh, over the growing season anytime there are pulses of nitrogen available in the soil that resin will bind some of it and uh, so that'll give us a measure when I pull these out. Here's one marked they're just marked with a popsicle stick, so about 10 centimeters below the surface here, there's a little bag of resin that has collected all the pulses. It's got a little sample of the nitrogen that's been released over the entire growing season. Uh, so I can also extract nitrogen from those in the same way to get a measure of rather than one particular point in time over the whole growing season. The, the main thing that we measure out here is changes in species composition. We want to know if Medusa head grass was 80% cover uh, in all the plots when we started, what's the percent cover of Medusa head grass um, in the different treatment plots over time as we go through this, this treatment? And additionally, we want to see changes in all the other species too, not just Medusa head grass. So, what replaces it if we impact it? And uh, the way we do that is actually just a visual estimation, which is a pretty common method for this. But I use this one meter frame with this grid of uh, four centimeter squares in it to help kind of guide my estimation. So we set this down in the center of the plot to minimize you know, the edge effect from uh, neighboring plots and from the surrounding environment. Then we come in here and um, based on, you know, we kind of look at these squares and look at the vegetation underneath it and see how many of them are occupied by the different species and that way we can get a percent cover estimation for each one. Uh, first year was complete control data. Before we did anything, we measured species composition in all of these plots and the average percent cover of Medusa head was about uh, 89%. It was nearly 90%. Um, and then what we did is we did the first year of mowing and we just mowed at this one key time that we thought would be effective. Um, and then we let an entire growing season go by and then come back that same time the next year and measure the species composition again. And what we found in that first year is that there was uh, about a 65%, a net 65% reduction in Medusa head grass. Grasslands are a part of our environment that I think are often overlooked, um, yet they have a huge importance to all of us, right? I mean, obviously, uh, they have a lot of intrinsic value to someone like me who's just kind of naturally fascinated with them. But even if I don't think this grassland is pretty or fascinating, it is cleansing the air in the valley that I live in. Grasslands, especially in arid regions, have a tremendous ability to sequester carbon from the air and store it stably in, in their dense root structure in the soil. And uh, it cleans the water that we rely on in the valley. You know, we have reservoirs that capture our water, but the water in those reservoirs runs over these hills, right? And so what the land cover is and the quality of the land cover influences what the quality of that water will be. Grasslands have a great capability to clean water that runs over them. And, uh, and of course, grasslands can provide forage for, for animals like uh, cattle out here that we rely on for food. And while it would be um, a tremendous, uh, there would be a lot of impacts associated with converting a grassland like this to uh, cultivated agriculture, you can still produce food off of it with grazing animals and maintain a lot of the other functions of the landscape, such as this watershed function of cleansing runoff, such as its ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere, 